Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Illuminating the Druggable GPCR Ohm, presented by Brian L. Roth, Michael Hooker, Distinguished Professor, Department of Pharmacology and Division of Chemical Biology and Medicinal Chemistry, Echelon School of Pharmacy. I'm Alexis Kraus of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the accreditation button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roth. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here today. Um, and uh, as was mentioned, uh, today I'm going to speak about the druggable uh, GPCR ohm. And before I start, I would just like to say that a lot of this work uh, has been done in my lab uh, and in collaboration with uh, Brian Shoiket's lab at UCSF. And uh, all of the work that I'm presenting today is sponsored by the National Institute of Health, uh, primarily through a new initiative, uh, Illuminating the Druggable Genome. Um, and our particular project relates to G protein coupled receptors. Uh, one, one final bit of housekeeping here. Uh, I'm in the School of Medicine as well as the School of Pharmacy at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, so today what I'm going to talk about are G protein coupled receptors and uh, uh, new advances in drug discovery and uh, target development. And uh, just by way of background, G protein coupled receptors represent the largest family of druggable targets in the human genome. This is a pie chart of the genome uh, published uh, many years ago, still uh, very current. And uh, what you can see from this is that G protein coupled receptors, which number around 900, represent approximately 4% of the DNA the open reading frames that are encoded by the human genome and by far and away represent the largest uh, family of druggable targets in the human genome. Uh, and G protein coupled receptors coupled to multiple signaling pathways. Uh, they are seven transmembrane domain proteins here you can see on the left hand side uh, following uh, agonist binding. Uh, a conformational change occurs leading to the dissociation of their heterotrimeric G protein and uh, activation of various downstream effectors. In this case, this is a G-alpha-Q coupled G protein coupled receptor, uh, activates uh, PLC leading to uh, the release of inositol trisphosphate and ultimately the mobilization of intracellular calcium. And this is uh, what is generally called canonical uh, G protein coupled receptor signaling. Uh, following that, uh, the receptors are phosphorylated, arrestins bind, and arrestins have two functions. The first is to stop signaling uh, through G proteins, hence the, the name arrestin. And secondly, uh, they serve as scaffolds for various downstream effectors, most notably members of the RAF MEC ERK kinase pathway. And this causes another uh, type of signaling, which is different in kinetics and texture from canonical G protein signaling and uh, has opened the possibility for uh, ultimately tailoring drugs which activate G protein signaling versus arrestin and vice versa, which may have uh, better efficacy and fewer side effects than uh, currently available medications. Now, uh, my lab is involved mainly in uh, structure function studies of G protein coupled receptors as well as uh, drug discovery related to them. 
And uh, by way of background, uh, around 20 years ago, my lab uh, received a large program uh, funded by the National Institute of Health, uh, which is a small molecule drug discovery program. And uh, if we can just go back here one slide, uh, one of the nice things about G-protein coupled receptors is that they uh, couple to multiple downstream signaling pathways. And this is, uh, is uh, helpful not only for uh, discovering drugs which activate various pathways, but also for devising assays uh, with which to screen uh, GPCR. So they're very easy to screen. And uh, because of this, uh, we uh, some years ago set up a parallel screening platform which allows us to screen uh, large numbers of molecular targets focused mainly on G-protein coupled receptors in a highly parallel fashion. And this schematically shows uh, how that's done. Basically, uh, every plate would get a different uh, receptor and then we would screen relatively uh, sort of modest uh, libraries of small molecules against them. And uh, over the years, uh, this has uh, resulted in a large number of very important findings uh, which are summarized in, uh, in many of these papers and some of these uh, we'll be discussing today. And I think part of the success of this program has been the fact that uh, our lab uses a rather unusual uh, and novel form of screening, which we call massively parallel screening, where hundreds of targets will be interrogated simultaneously rather than the typical approach, which is to take sort of a single receptor here and screen large numbers of compounds against it. Now, one of the one of the nice things about uh, G protein coupled receptors and studying them, as I as I mentioned before, and I'm going to use the acronym GPCRs uh, going forward, is that they're the largest family of druggable targets in the human genome. Uh, there are around 400 uh, what are called non-olfactory GPCRs in the human genome. Uh, perhaps a third of approved and investigational drugs act on G-protein coupled receptors as their primary target. And uh, interestingly enough, in addition to the 30% of approved medications which have GPCRs as their primary target, most drugs and, uh, and reagents that, that are used in, in cell biology and chemical biology investigation, in addition to approved medications, have uh, important off-target actions at GPCRs, and this includes many selective kinase inhibitors. Uh, and of, the, of this entire family of GPCRs, which we call the gpcr ohm, a large portion of it is understudied. And just to illustrate this uh, and the importance of this for drug discovery, both the known as well as the understudied GPCRs, I'd like to take you through a, a little um, project that I conducted uh, about a year or so ago and basically what I did is I took a, the list of uh, FDA approved medications. They were curated by myself for their canonical target. And I also looked at uh, a list of drugs that were in development. And this was from a recent uh, issue of Nature Reviews Drug Discovery and also uh, curated them. And then I mapped them onto a tree of uh, GPCRs. And that's shown here. And this was uh, published in Cell a few months ago. And what you can see here uh, is that uh, although there are many, many drugs uh, uh, that target GPCRs, they, uh, in essence, target just a handful of the known G-protein coupled receptors. So you can see some receptors here, like histamine receptors, muscarinic receptors, dopamine receptors, have large numbers of drugs targeted to them. But most uh, GPCRs in the genome that are certainly druggable have very few, if any, uh, uh, GPC, uh, drugs targeted to them, and in fact, around 90% of uh, GPCRs have absolutely no drugs uh, targeted to them at all. Uh, and that's the same not only for drugs that are already approved, but for drugs in development. Uh, and if you do the same exercise looking at um, drugs that are in various stages of late preclinical and early clinical development, uh, these target uh, perhaps 30% of the druggable GPCR on. So we have a large portion of the druggable genome, which is uh, potentially uh, uh, ripe for drug discovery. Looking at it uh, another way, um, what I uh, 
what I did was I uh, went through and uh, did a PubMed search of essentially all of the druggable uh, GPCRs in the human genome and uh, simply added up, added up the number of citations for every uh, GPCR and then plotted it here against uh, every GPCR in the genome. And uh, basically what you can see here is a bimodal distribution where about half of the GPCRs in the genome have hundreds to thousands of papers uh, devoted to them, whereas another half uh, have less than 100 uh, papers, and a lot of these have just a few. And if you dig down into this, uh, into this understudied uh, area, you'll find of these 100 or so papers, most of them are either review articles or genome-wide association studies, which simply list the name of a GPCR and have no particular uh, scientific uh, information associated with them. So a large number of these are understudied uh, as well as being underutilized in terms of drug discovery. If you look at it a third way, uh, and here again, we're looking at a phylogenetic tree of the GPCR ohm. And uh, what I've done here is I have simply uh, tabulated the number of small molecules that, are, that have been annotated in the uh, chemistry literature against uh, various members of the GPCR superfamily. And wherever there's a large circle, uh, what this means is that few, if any, uh, small molecules or drugs have been annotated against that particular GPCR. Yeah, where there's a small circle, uh, this means that hundreds or thousands of, of small molecules have been annotated against them. And what you can see is that uh, some receptors, for example, the biogenic amine receptors, for instance, have thousands of uh, small molecules targeted against them. Uh, most of the GPCRs in the genome actually have very few, uh, if any, uh, small molecules that are targeted against them. So again, this is a, a huge uh, area, potentially uh, very valuable for therapeutic drug discovery. So we, uh, taking advantage of this, uh, we coined the term O uh, GPCRs for understudied and orphan GPCRs, those GPCRs which, for which there's very little information. And these uh, primarily are the, are are going to be the subject of today's talk. Toward the end of the talk, I'll, I'll talk about some more uh, well-known GPCRs. But we know from uh, expression uh, studies and precedent, uh, they should have important roles in signaling and physiology. And uh, we believe most of them actually are druggable from a drug discovery perspective. And unfortunately, most of them have no known ligands. Uh, the signaling pathways are unknown. And this uh, can make screening difficult. Uh, in addition to uh, not knowing much about these particular receptors, uh, what we and others have found is that much of the published data, uh, even about these uh, understudied GPCRs, are difficult to replicate. And this is because they're very complex and sensitive to assay conditions in unpredictable ways. And finally, uh, just by uh, nature of the fact uh, that GPCRs are involved in signaling and there's a high degree of redundancy, knockout uh, or genetic deletion of individual GPCRs frequently has uh, little, uh, if any, uh, uh, gross uh, phenotype making, uh, studying them by uh, uh, emerging genetic technologies like CRISPR uh, problematic. And just to illustrate uh, the, uh, the potential importance of these orphan and understudy GPCRs as therapeutically relevant uh, targets, I want to um, point out a few discoveries, uh, which you can see in one of our recent papers, where these understudy GPCRs turned out to be extremely important for therapeutic and or side effects of uh, known medications. For example, in the upper left-hand side, you can see uh, that erythromycin, and certain side effects related to macrolid antibiotics have been revealed uh, to be uh, due to the modulin receptor. Uh, very serious uh, therapy uh, side effects of ergots and appetite suppressing medications were involved, were found to be involved uh, with, uh, with a particular understudied serotonin receptor. Benzodiazepines, which are commonly used for treating anxiety, have important uh, effects at an orphan receptor, GPR88. Drugs like morphine, which are used uh, widely for treatment of pain, uh, 
uh, many of their side effects now appear to be uh, mediated through a understudied uh, GPCR called MRGPRX2 and so on. Um, and uh, if, if you're interested in, in these and other findings, uh, I, uh, I urge you to read the uh, review article that's uh, listed there uh, and shown here. Now for the rest of the talk, uh, what I'd like to do is, um, is spend most of it uh, explaining uh, how we then interrogate these understudy GPCRs. And first I'll tell you about uh, uh, a platform that we recently revealed, uh, which allows for genome-wide screening of the entire uh, family of these receptors, and then a computational pipeline that we have built. Um, I'd then like to show you how this works in practice using libraries of annotated uh, small molecules. And uh, finally, uh, I'd like to show you how we can uh, use X-ray crystal structures to discover new ligands for both studied as well as understudied GPCRs. So if we go to the first uh, uh, part of the talk, uh, large-scale discovery of ligands for uh, these understudied GPCRs, I just want to give a shout out to the people that in my lab that were involved in this. Uh, and you can see them there, Wes, uh, Xi Ping, Flory, and Vince uh, were the main drivers of this particular um, uh, uh, endeavor. And so as I mentioned at, at the very beginning of this talk, uh, GPCR signaling is very complicated. Uh, they can signal through a number of G proteins and uh, it's frequently difficult to determine in advance uh, which particular G protein or signal pathway particular GPCR might signal through. But what we know is that virtually all of them also have important interactions with arrestin. And we took advantage of this to uh, devise a, a uh, basically a platform where we could screen the entire uh, GPCR ohm essentially in a single 384 well plate. And the uh, assay that we used, uh, we borrowed from uh, uh, or took uh, inspiration from a uh, platform that was developed by uh, Richard in Richard Axel's lab by Gilead Barnea, which uses uh, beta restin as a platform. And basically what you have is an engineered uh, GPCR with a, a tail, uh, which has been engineered uh, to be a very high affinity binding site for restin. And following ligand binding, uh, there's translocation of a uh, arrestin uh, TEV protease uh, chimeric protein. Uh, this allows the release of a transcriptional activator, which then activates the, the TET uh, transcriptional machinery in engineered cells, ultimately leading to luciferase as a readout. And this uh, basically yields light. And for those uh, in the audience that have been involved in screening, know that luciferase is a very, and, and luciferase-based assays are extremely robust and very sensitive and can easy, easily be done in 384 and higher well formats. And over the years, uh, as you can see from those references, my lab has used this platform uh, basically in a single GPCR by GPCR uh, 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 application. And simply because this, this assay worked so well, what we decided to do was to see if we could uh, uh, exemplify this uh, platform across the entire uh, GPCR ohm to, to essentially make a universal assay platform for GPCRs. The way we did this was we used a modular design strategy where we took the open reading frames of GPCRs uh, which is notated here as GPCR CDS, and then place them uh, in a module that consisted of uh, various epitope tags, uh, the vasopressin tail, the TEV protease site, and the transcriptional activator. And uh, the individual GPCRs were then synthesized by a synthetic DNA uh, technology company. And overall, uh, around 90% of the known olfactory GPCRs were synthesized this includes virtually all the orphaned GPCRs, and they were expressed at, at very high levels on the cell surface. And we performed intensive validation on those uh, for which there are known ligands. And uh, 
And uh, as you can see, uh, this was published uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this gives you a sense of the validation. So in the upper left-hand corner uh, is an overview of the platform. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see uh, untransfected cells or cells that are transfected with two sort of random uh, orphan GPCRs. You can see very high levels of expression. And then in the bottom two panels, uh, we can see on the left-hand side uh, how uh, signaling through the assay works, uh, the arrestin based uh, Tango platform, or through canonical signaling through calcium. And you can see for both, for this particular understudied receptor, which is a neuromedin B receptor, very, very nice level of uh, signaling, very nice uh, <coughs> dose response and signal to noise. And overall, if we map the entire platform against the entire GPCRO, wherever there's a colored circle is, is basically where we have a validated assay. And you can see with the exception of the adhesion and the taste and receptors, we have essentially a saturation coverage of the entire GPCRO. And just to give you a sense of how useful this is, we uh, did a study where we screen 91 of these understudied GPCRs against a small panel of approved medications. Uh, and uh, this shown on the left is a heat map of those data. You can see a relatively sparse heat map, which is good. It means that, that uh, there's not a lot of promiscuous activity. You can see a couple of bands going across, which uh, represent uh, essentially promiscuous compounds. Uh, but if we uh, screen in or zoom in to a certain area of the heat map, you can see uh, how sparse this matrix is. If we blow this up, uh, you'll see that uh, the single uh, red square uh, corresponds to the activation of a particular orphan GPCR, in this case, one called MRGPRX4 by the drug nitaglinide. Now, nitaglinide is an interesting drug. It's approved the channel modulator, potassium channel modulator, approved for use in metabolic disorders, uh, but it has uh, side effects of itch, and we believe that the side effects of itch actually are probably due to off-target uh, interactions with this uh, understudy GPCR, MRGPRX4. Now, this uh, is now available as a resource. It allows unbiased screening of the entire drug of all genome, gpcr -ohm in a single 384-well plate. Uh, it's robust and scalable. It allows for the identification of novel targets for known drugs and drug-like compounds. And uh, one of the things that we've done is we've made this resource available uh, via AdGene, so it's open source. And uh, to date, around uh, 8,000 orders have been shared via AdGene, and uh, my lab doesn't make any money with this. It's something that, uh, that we have uh, provided to the scientific community at a nominal fee through uh, AdGene. One of the other uh, things that this, this, this and related platforms have allowed us to do is, is, um, is to re-examine uh, issues of selectivity versus promiscuity. And this uh, comes from a, uh, a recent paper uh, where we uh, contributed to a study of um, a number of quote unquote selective uh, protein kinase inhibitors. And uh, the heat map of their activity against the kinome can be is shown in the blue uh, graph on the left, and a corresponding heat map of, of uh, their activity against uh, a subset of the GPCR is shown on the right. And you can see that even though many of these compounds are, are reasonably selective for uh, kinases, they have very promiscuous off-target actions at uh, GPCRs. And in many cases, this uh, can be in the single uh, digit nanomolar uh, level. And uh, this is likely uh, very important, not only for uh, side effects of uh, protein kinases, but uh, potentially for their therapeutic actions as well. So what I'm going to do next is uh, show you that now that we have these platforms available, uh, how you can use these uh, platforms of highly, uh, in combination of libraries of highly annotated uh, small molecules to infer functions uh, and identify drugs for uh, these understudied GPCRs. And I'm going to uh, essentially go over two papers. 
that have been published in the last couple of years. The first is a paper in Nature, which was published a little over two years ago. And the approach uh, we took for this paper was twofold. So initially, uh, what we did was uh, to, to do a small molecule screen against a large number of uh, understudied GPCRs, as, as I showed you earlier when we had done nataglinide. And uh, what we found uh, in this uh, screen was that certain drugs uh, in the benzodiazepine family had reasonably high affinity for a, a orphan GPCR called GPR68. Uh, efforts to optimize uh, uh, these benzodiazepine derivatives to uh, probe-like or uh, tool-like small molecules was, was un, uh, basically unsuccessful. And so what we did is we took a computational approach, uh, and uh, this is the approach that I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, for, for the next little bit of the talk. And this was uh, pioneered by Brian Choiquet's lab uh, with a very talented uh, graduate student, Joel Karpiak. And essentially uh, what he did was we had uh, initial chemical matter for this particular orphan GPCR, GPR68. We had no structures for it. But there were uh, structures available for a family member which had uh, some uh, degree of similarity, in this case, around 29%. Uh, a large number of models were then uh, built uh, using homology to uh, CXCR4 using the program modeler, and total uh, 3,300 diverse homology models were built. Uh, these were then uh, used to um, select uh, for compounds that were known to interact with this uh, receptor, as well as for compounds that were known not to interact with them. Uh, further, uh, to pick among the various models. Uh, and then uh, mutagenesis and further modeling uh, was performed to identify a putative uh, binding site for uh, uh, drug discovery uh, within the receptor. And that's shown here. So essentially, uh, what we uh, what we realized uh, in the course of uh, of the modeling and uh, the initial uh, probe discovery was that there was likely a uh, uh, two types of sites: an allosteric, what's called an allosteric site, for drugs which are specific for this particular receptor, as well as another site for uh, hydrogen ions, which uh, uh, in normal cells target this receptor, and that's called the orthosteric site. Uh, armed with this knowledge, uh, Joel performed a large-scale docking campaign, and in total, uh, around 3 million compounds were docked against the receptor, targeting these various domains. And in the first round of docking, uh, compounds uh, at, like those at the bottom of the screen appeared. Um, these were then tested against uh, GPR68. Uh, those that were active were then uh, used to seed search for uh, new compounds, uh, which led to compounds in the middle. And this process was repeated again uh, and yielded compounds like those uh, near the top. And that particular compound uh, turned out to be a positive allosteric modulator for GPR68, uh, uh, which we dubbed Ogarin. And uh, the reason uh, for this is that uh, GPR68 at one time was known as OGR1 or ovarian cancer-related GPCR1, uh, so we dubbed it Ogarin. Now, Ogarin uh, is a very unusual compound in that it doesn't directly activate the receptor, but it's a positive allosteric modulator uh, against uh, the native ligand which in this case is hydrogen ions. So you can see when we graph uh, activation of the receptor versus pH, uh, which is shown here in the, in the black uh, circles at the bottom, that's the native activation of the receptor uh, by hydrogen ions. And in the presence of increasing concentrations of ogarin, which we have with the, uh, uh, shown uh, with the red arrow, there's an increase in the potency and the efficacy of GPR68 to be activated. Uh, so this uh, indicates that this is a 
a true positive allosteric modulator. And uh, what was uh, uh, gratifying to us is that the uh, final uh, probe compound bore, bore uh, very little uh, structural uh, similarity to the known allosteric modulators of GPR68 that we had uncovered in our small molecule screen, uh, drugs like lorazepam, uh, also known as um, uh, Ativan, and uh, desmethyldiazepam, which is a, a derivative of Valium. Not only uh, is the compound active, uh, activating GPR68 uh, in cell culture, we also found it was active in activating GPR68 in vivo. In this case, we used a contextual fear conditioning uh, assay because GPR68 uh, is known to be enriched in the hippocampus. Uh, you can see that uh, in wild-type mice, uh, Ogren reduced contextual fear conditioning but has absolutely no effect in GPR68 knockout mice. And it was also inactive on related uh, GPCRs as well as uh, other GPCRs in the genome, inactive in control cells, inactive on GABA receptors, uh, as predicted had weak, very weak activity at adenosine 2A receptors, uh, but importantly provides a role for GPR68 in learning since it affects contextual fear uh, conditioning and provides a tool to modulate uh, GPR68. So that shows uh, our, our, our pipeline, which is a combination of uh, uh, physical screening as well as uh, computational. I want to give one more example here of how, uh, how this pipeline works in practice. This is a, uh, from a more recent uh, paper uh, we studied, uh, uh, we published, which relates to this uh, very interesting uh, family of receptors, the MRGPRX family of receptors. Now, this is an a interesting family of orphan receptors. They get their name, MRGPRX, from the mass-related G-protein-coupled receptor uh, family. They're called X because they're primate-exclusive. They're not found in, in mouse or rats or other, other rodents. They're expressed at very high levels in the dorsal root ganglia, as well as mast cells and other immune cells. And they've been linked to, to pain and itch. Uh, and uh, we, as I mentioned, we had this uh, Tango assay platform, and uh, we decided to use this to see if we could uh, identify initial chemical matter for MRGPRX2 uh, and ultimately to identify uh, tool compounds. And as I mentioned, this is uh, exclusive to the transfected receptor, is scalable, and uh, very robust. So our approach was uh, to took a take a relatively small library of compounds. In this case, uh, 6,800 were screened against various members of the MRGPRX family. Uh, actives were then validated in concentration response curves. And then uh, based on uh, orthogonal assays and ligand structure, uh, we began to infer uh, uh, things like receptor properties, function, and off-target drug effects. So this is the result of our small molecule screen. We were able to find actives for three members of this family, MRGPR X1, X2, and X4. You can see there was some overlap uh, between the three. MRGPR X2 had the largest number of active compounds, uh, a little over 80, and that was the one that we focused on. It's a G-alpha-Q uh, coupled uh, GPCR. There are no known selective small molecule ligands. It has a role in sensory neurons, but is unknown and also is known to induce degranulation in mast cells. And uh, one of the interesting things that we found was that uh, uh, commonly prescribed medications like opioids, as well as opioid-like drugs, uh, tended to activate uh, MRGPRX2, and you can see a couple of the scaffolds uh, that we discovered. Uh, and when we looked at a large number of uh, opioid uh, medications, as well as uh, opioid small molecules and natural products, we found an interesting SAR. So you could, these are all technically morphinan uh, drugs, 
uh, and uh, compounds uh, that had uh, relatively small substituents there on the uh, on the methyl group on the morphinan ring tended to be active, whereas those that had larger substituents uh, tended to be inactive. Uh, and the fact that there was this uh, very clear-cut SAR and association with a particular uh, scaffold uh, led us to believe that, uh, or gave us uh, uh, confidence that this was a, a real interaction. Uh, as I mentioned, a number of morphinans and morphinan-like compounds uh, had uh, potency for MRGPRX2. None of them were selective. Uh, and we were never able to drive the potency down into the nanomolar range, which we need for a, a useful tool compound. But the fact that, that we had a large number of compounds uh, led us to believe that we could use the same approach that, that we had used with uh, GPR-68 to find uh, potential tool compounds for it. So again, what we did is we uh, made it, or Joel made a model uh, for the uh, for MRGPRX2. In this case, we could align it to the kappa opiate receptor. Uh, by then we had large numbers of compounds we could dock against the various models as well as decoys. This led to a optimized model uh, for ligand recognition uh, for which we did uh, site-directed mutagenesis to uh, verify the model. Uh, and then uh, once we had the model, we were then able to dock 6 million lead-like compounds uh, against the receptor. Uh, this led to uh, the initial identification of micromolar potency compounds and ultimately submicromolar uh, compounds. Uh, you can see here zinc 9232 as well as a matched pair, uh, a matched inactive analog. Uh, which, as I'll show you, were active against MRGPRX uh, in vitro and in vivo. So this uh, basically shows that uh, MRGPRX2 can be activated by this tool compound uh, for both uh, non-canonical or arrestant signaling as well as canonical signaling. signaling uh, it's a GQ-coupled receptor through intracellular calcium release. 1067 was a control compound, and DMSO, of course, is vehicle. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, MRGPRX2 uh, in humans is found in mast cells, and uh, mast cells uh, induce uh, degranulation uh, in, uh, in uh, exposure to allergens, and this leads to histamine release. So many of the symptoms that you or your relatives may experience, uh, seasonal rhinitis, colds, uh, allergies, et cetera, are due to histamine release from mast cells. Um, it turns out that uh, mast cells are a very uh, useful system to evaluate MRGPRX2 because they are uh, expressed endogenously. And uh, so we decided to use the LAD2 cell, which is a human mast cell line which endogenously expresses MRGPRX2 and uh, measured uh, intracellular calcium release as well as the release of beta hexose aminidase, which is a measure of mast cell degranulation. And when we measured beta hexose aminidase uh, release, you can see that uh, our, our tool compound uh, was reasonably potent at activating it, along with other compounds that were known to have activity. Uh, and interestingly enough for uh, both uh, plus and minus uh, morphine. And uh, these results were uh, very consistent with our data uh, that we obtained with uh, transfected uh, hex cells. And uh, one of the uh, uh, things that's known about MRGPRX2 is that agonists promote degranulation in a non-IgE dependent uh, fashion. And that's uh, uh, basically shown here. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, that uh, based on all of this information, we proposed that this might be the mechanism for a previously known uh, and widely reported opioid drug effect. So it's known, for instance, that uh, people that take opioids like morphine uh, and so on, uh, in addition to the uh, beneficial effects of opioids, uh, frequently have uh, itching, uh, so it's called puritis, uh, technically. And 
This has been known for decades, uh, and recently, uh, say the last 20 years or so, has been known uh, to be uh, induced by morphine and uh, similar medications, but not mediated by canonical opioid receptors. And uh, some of the strongest evidence for that is because the drug codeine, which itself is inactive, it, codeine actually has to be metabolized to morphine, can induce uh, mast cell uh, degranulation. Uh, so it, it doesn't affect uh, 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 opiate receptors, uh, but requires G proteins. So, so what we think basically is that uh, this receptor, MRGPRX2, is the long uh, sought uh, itch receptor uh, mediated, uh, which uh, mediates uh, many of the side effects of opioids. Uh, we think that uh, medications that target this might be very effective for uh, treating pain and itch. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the uh, main approaches we're using now is to use uh, computational docking uh, to uh, identify uh, new ligands for orphan and understudy GPCRs. I just want to give a shout out to uh, my collaborators, uh, the Brian Choiquet Lab. Uh, they have built a database called Zinc. It's entirely in the public domain. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, it had 6 million compounds in stock for docking. There now are over 160 million compounds uh, in, available, and in a few years, there will be more than a billion compounds available uh, for uh, computational docking. So those of you that are interested in these technologies, please uh, check out their site, uh, zinc.org. So uh, what I showed you uh, in the in the first uh, main part of my talk was uh, how we can use uh, advanced computational approaches as well as small molecule drug discovery, uh, which is enabled by new uh, screening technologies to find um, drug-like compounds for uh, these understudy GPCRs. Uh, as you may know, uh, over the last uh, few years, there have been a number of uh, GPCRs for which high-resolution crystal structures have been uh, published, uh, many from my lab and my collaborators, and I'd just like to give you a, a, a brief uh, view on how we might use these crystal structures to identify uh, new ligands. What I'm going to do is uh, just highlight a recent paper that was published in Science uh, just a couple of months ago, where we solved the structure of the D4 dopamine receptor. So dopamine uh, is a very important neurotransmitter. Uh, it's involved in virtually uh, all of the rewarding stimuli, uh, rewarding properties of virtually all stimuli, drugs, uh, alcohol, uh, sex, uh, Twitter, and so on. Um, dysregulation of dopaminergic neurotransmission uh, is also involved in a number of diseases, Parkinson's disease, other basal ganglia disorders, schizophrenia, virtually all psychiatric disorders. There are five dopamine receptors in the genome. If you go to uh, chemical databases, uh, thousands of compounds are annotated against them, and large numbers of papers in PubMed. Uh, but despite all this interest in dopamine and dopamine receptors, creating subtype selective ligands has proved challenging. And uh, what we found when we obtained the first high-resolution view of a dopamine receptor was that there, and this is just a summary of that structure, down to 1.95 angstroms was that there was this interesting water network uh, stabilizing receptor. Uh, you can see the uh, electron density maps here were, were very, very high, indicating very high le level of resolution. But the interesting thing from a drug discovery perspective was that when we compared this structure with the previous uh, relatively low resolution structure of a related receptor, D3, we found that there was a new extended binding pocket here uh, for the drug that we used to uh, solve the structure here, um, which was unique for the D4 receptor and it was not found in the D3. And I just want to draw your attention to this because we last week published in Nature the structure of the D2 receptor and we find that, that this extended binding pocket is also not found in the D2 receptor. So uh, given the fact that there's this extended binding pocket, it really opened up the possibility that we could use this pocket to uh, 
identify new, new and selective ligands for the D4 receptor. So what was done, again, we went to our collaborators, Brian Shoiket's lab, in this case, Annette Levitt, and she docked a little over a million compounds against the structure of the D2 receptor. In, in total, this was uh, trillions of complexes uh, and high, uh, high scoring compounds uh, scored by the docking algorithm were then obtained and, and tested. And you can see in a typical screen here on the right, uh, around uh, three of the 10 or so compounds, so about a 30% hit rate uh, were obtained. Um, these compounds, uh, the best of these compounds, which we call compound nine, was then uh, taken uh, with an iterative strategy that involved analog screen and redocking. And in total, a uh, number of compounds uh, were obtained from that screen. Two distinct chemotypes were found, uh, compound 9-6 and 9-11. These were then, uh, as you can see, uh, higher affinity, in this case, uh, uh, 30 to 60 nanomolar. Uh, an analog screen uh, and redocking was done, and this led to our final compound 9-6-24, which now has a single-digit nanomolar uh, potency and is 10,000-fold uh, selective against the D4 receptor. So you can see in a relatively straightforward process, we were able to go from uh, micromolar compounds to single-digit nanomolar compounds. In this case, without any chemistry, all of these compounds were uh, commercially available. So the highlights of this structure, it's the highest resolution structure of a biogenic amine receptor. The first uh, GPCR that was crystallized with and without explicit sodium. Uh, the extended binding pocket revealed residues essential for uh, receptor subtype selectivity and uh, yielded a platform uh, which yielded new chemical matter for the D4 dopamine receptor. And so that's uh, all I want to say today. I want to thank you very much uh, for listening. I just want to highlight uh, people in my lab who did this work. Uh, the first part of the talk was done, uh, headed up by Wes, uh, Xi Ping, and the second part uh, was done by Kate, uh, primarily uh, with Wes's help and our collaborators, Brian Choiket and Joel Karpiak. And the D4 receptor uh, structure was done uh, with uh, Shang and uh, Anat Levitt. Also want to acknowledge the funding, uh, NIH, uh, Illuminating the Druggable Genome, and then Kate uh, had a grant from the Pharma Foundation. Uh, and thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Roth, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, can you tell me about how to access the screening program? Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, the, the easiest way to access it is to, uh, to simply top, type my name into Google, uh, Brian Roth, and uh, you'll go to our website. Uh, it's the uh, NIMH Psychoactive Drug Screening Center. Um, and uh, if, you, uh, if you basically go there, there's uh, uh, basically a, a very nice uh, menu that uh, provides uh, all sorts of information on, on how you might uh, obtain screening. Uh, we have an online database, which is, has been very popular. We get about a million hits a month. Um, and, uh, and other information there. Now, and our second the question. Other, the other thing I might, uh, I might uh, mention is that uh, the screening is available to anyone uh, who is funded by the National Institute of Health. Uh, it's paid for with the grant that we have from the NIH, and screening is entirely free and confidential. So um, it's, it's a really good deal. So next question. Our next question is, what are the new frontiers in GPCR drug discovery? So uh, I would say there are two. So one, 
One frontier that I mentioned a lot in this particular talk is with the uh, really the revolution that's ongoing in GPCR structure determination. We're now able to take advantage of these structures and use uh, very advanced computational approaches to find new chemical matter for the receptors. And so many, many labs are doing that. I think this is a very active area. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, currently uh, we're able to uh, access uh, uh, bas basically uh, libraries of small molecules that are uh, virtual of 100, uh, 100 plus million compounds, so way more than could ever be screened in a physical way. The other uh, uh, big area of GPCR research uh, currently and the frontier is re relates to bias signaling. I didn't I didn't go into that uh, to any extent in the talk, but if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned there are these uh, broadly speaking two pathways of GPCR signaling through G protein and arrestin. It's becoming clear that activating one pathway over the other uh, may be very important either for side effects or therapeutic effects of both approved and candidate medications. And so the idea is that if we can take make drugs that target uh, either the arrestin pathway or the G protein pathway, we might be able to make safer and more effective uh, medications. So I would say that's that's the other frontier. The third, of course, are these understudied GPCRs. We you know don't know anything about them. Uh, really, any any new information is likely to be very important going forward. And it looks like we have time for one more question. What if you don't have a GPCR structure? Right. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you don't have a structure, what we can do is we can do uh, computational modeling. And, and uh, as, as was exemplified uh, in the talk, and uh, one of the nice things about, about that approach, as well as the approaches that I, that I mentioned here, is all of these resources, Modeler, uh, which is used to make the models, uh, Zinc, the Zinc library, which is uh, a source of the, of the compounds, and then the program Doc, which is used to dock the compounds, as well as our screening resources. These are all now available in the public domain without really any restrictions to use by academic investigators. So, um, particularly the computational approaches uh, actually can can be used um, remotely. Uh, so if you if you simply have access to a PC or a Mac and the internet, uh, you can you can actually use these resources, create your own models, and then do the docking. Uh, you know, potentially in your own in your own home without without a lab. So it's it uh, the technology is has really. Uh, become quite uh, user friendly. I would like to once again thank Dr. Roth for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we thank go, you. I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on demand viewing through May of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.